Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first part of Structural Geology 301. In this part, we are going to cover essentially the uh, formation and nature of structures in the ductile field. But before we get there, let's uh, have a look at the course outline. So in this first part, uh, structures in the ductile field, we have uh, four different sections. Uh, the first one is a classification section. Uh, we are going to look at types of foliations and lineations and to some extent how they form. We look then at more specific structures, uh, boudins, mouillons, and uh, at competence contrasts that are responsible to form these uh, structures. In the third section, we will look at shear sense indicators, which are very important for the kinematic interpretation of a region. And in chapter four, we are going to talk about pure, simple, and general shear modes. This will be a, quite a challenging section, uh, but uh, it will help us to understand how fol foliations and shear sense indicators actually form from the mechanical point of view. In the second part of the course, we are looking at large-scale processes, at tectonic settings, in uh, which actually all these structures form that we have covered in the second year course and in the first part of the third year course. And in an introduction, I will uh, review uh, the, the main tectonic settings uh, that we have been talking about in first year. And then in more detail, extensional settings such as rifts or lacogens and uh, extension in back arcs. The contractional settings we will cover in some sort of case studies from uh, the Andes, Japan, the Himalayas, and the Alps, which are classical regions of contractional settings. And of course, uh, transform settings, uh, the third important uh, group of tectonic settings, uh, will be covered with examples from the San Andreas Fault in California and some features uh, that we see in, along the Alpine Fault in New Zealand. So let's start with the first section, uh, structures in the ductile field, classification of foliations and lineations. So here we are going to uh, essentially look at um, the naming and classification, but also to some extent at the formation of foliations and lineations. These are structures essentially forming in the ductile field. And uh, like with all structures, we have primary structures and we have secondary structures for the foliations, a primary foliation for instance, could be a magmatic layering. That is a foliation that forms when the rock forms. And uh, also flow banding in rhyolites, or so-called schlierens in migmatites and granites. All these features that form uh, repeated and uh, uniform planar features can be classified as foliations. In this case, uh, magmatic foliations, essentially. In the sedimentary field, a line, pebbles in a conglomerate could define a foliation or sedimentary bedding if it is planar, regular, and uniform in thickness. This is pretty much a uh, short definition of a foliation. Foliations are planar, regularly occurring, and uniform features. Specifically, their thickness should be more or less uniform. And with sedimentary bedding, uh, here you certainly might have uh, problems now and then to fulfill this kind of definition, these requirements. We are interested in secondary foliations. That means foliations that are superimposed onto primary structures in a rock by deformation processes. And here there are four different and four important ones. Cleavage and gestosity. There are subtypes to these types of foliation. Then there's a differentiated metamorphic layering. So this implies that material segregates during uh, deformation and metamorphic process. And then we have myelonitic foliation, which uh, also has some similarities with, with cleavage. But uh, we will see that the myelonite, myelonitic foliation requires some further characteristics to uh, fulfill its definition. This here is a illustration, an illustration taken from Pashi and Trau's textbook, which uh, explains the main foliation forming processes in rocks. And all of them have in common that uh, either sheet-like crystals or lenses rotate into a uniform orientation and therefore define a foliation, because uh, on the principle, a foliation is the alignment of uh, structures and of markers 
typically minerals, most commonly platy minerals, sheet silicates, in a uniform orientation. And to achieve this uniform orientation, normally we have to have some uh, process of rotating them into that direction. And then we have transfer of material into an orientation that then would achieve lens-shaped geometry. So there are various different ones, and we briefly will address all of them. Let's have a look. Here, the first example would be uh, the conversion of such a kind of situation into such a kind of situation. And we see here that the random orientation of uh, crystals, needle or sheet-like crystals, or more um, uh, prismatic markers like feldspars, for instance, randomly oriented in a protolith, a granite, for instance, might rotate and elongate during deformation into a preferred orientation. You see here that most of these randomly oriented markers have rotated into a more vertical position as a result of horizontal shortening in this example. And also here, some of these markers have rotated towards a more uniform orientation. This one got uh, kinked and uh, folded, perhaps fractured, uh, in order to uh, align with a foliation that is on the way to develop, in this case, perpendicular to the shortening direction. In our example, vertical. There's here one crystal that has not rotated, but it got shortened. You see here this horizontally oriented crystal, which is parallel to the shortening direction, has shortened uniformly uh, in order to accommodate the strain to which the rock was exposed. Let's now look here at uh, examples two and three. We see here markers, minerals, crystals, um, shown as uh, circular or spherical bodies. And these uh, are changing their shape into ellipsoidal form. You see that here in both cases. And they do that in different ways. Here, the gray ones would undergo dissolution. That means we are dissolving material here on the high stress sides. And we are redistributing this material into the uh, strain shadows that we see here, uh, shown in white. So here are some sorts of overgrowth or re-precipitation of material eventually achieving this lens-shaped geometry, which can define a foliation. Here in uh, this example, we are seeing that the material internally redistributes material. So these grains essentially remain intact, but these grains are changing their shape from uh, circular or spherical in shape to elliptical or ellipsoidal. And also that then would define a preferred, a shape preferred orientation of these crystals defining a foliation, a vertical foliation in this example. Let's have a look at number four, preferential alignment during dissolution creep. So what we see here is the, uh, it's a similar uh, example actually like number two. We are seeing here a mixture of different minerals and uh, some of these mineral species are um, soluble and others have uh, uh, poorly dissolvable in a fluid phase and we see here that uh, the, the, mica, the mica crystal, which is uh, not easy to dissolve, is uh, rotating slowly into the orientation of the forming foliation. And uh, other materials, perhaps quartz crystals here, are in the process of getting dissolved. We have been talking about this process in Geology 202, in the uh, second chapter on strain on deformation in the brittle and ductile field. And here I just want to remind you to that example where we see uh, poorly aligned mica crystals in a quartz rich matrix. And uh, when we shorten, in this case, uh, this example vertically, dissolution of quartz would be the result provided that a fluid phase is uh, present and the mica crystals would rotate and get aligned. Uh, and uh, during such process, uh, SiO2 from the quartz would get dissolved in such a hydrous fluid which might escape from this place and uh, then can remove a significant 
proportion of quartz, which would result in volume loss, but it also would result in a higher density of mica crystals in the rock, a pronounced foliation, and a better alignment of these mica crystals with this foliation. So if you compare this poorly foliated rock here with the result of dissolution creep, you will see that here a pronounced and fairly well-defined foliation has formed. So going back to our example here from Pashian Trau, let's look at the next example. Here we have the random orientation of uh, crystals in the starting conditions. And also here we see uh, some fairly random orientation of crystals, but what we can see is that specific crystals have grown and others have not and perhaps even have become dissolved. So these would be the small ones, and uh, here we see the long ones. The long ones are those which are oriented parallel to the evolving foliation, because along the foliation you have a better transport of cations and minerals oriented in that foliation or close to that foliation will have better access to these uh, cations and grow faster, whereas other crystals at high angle to these fluid pathways uh, might not grow or might even get dissolved, depending on the uh, composition of the fluid and on the solubility of the mineral species. But also this can lead during shortening to the pronunciation of foliation preferential growth of crystals that are parallel to the foliation. Uh, and uh, this usually will be supported by the rotation of markers and shortening of markers. So typically, or, or very often, we will find the combination of some of these processes happening at the same time in a given rock. Looking here at uh, the example number six, uh, we might have oriented nucleation and growth in a stress field. Imagine there's a stress field and a metamorphic reaction takes place and new minerals grow. They might grow in a way that is aligned to the forming foliation. Again, this is caused by the uh, better access of such crystals to the supply of uh, cations coming in with the fluid phase. A similar process is mimetic or epitaxial growth along pre-existing phases parallel to the foliation. Assume that here these uh, white crystals are already existing, they are already aligned with the uh, foliation, and uh, new crystals use these pre-existing crystals to, uh, to grow. Uh, that is what we call uh, mimetic or epitaxial growth along pre-existing surfaces. It depends on uh, whether the crystal here and the new crystal that grows here is of the same species and the same composition, but such foliation surfaces typically are a good sites for the growth of new minerals, for the nucleation of new minerals, either of the same species or of a similar species. And last but not least, we might have uh, the growth of crystals uh, that are somehow controlled by the pre-existing foliations. Uh, imagine such a situation here. Foliation, the foliation is um, controlled and defined by mica crystals, and in between we have some isometric grain shapes of, say, quartz. Uh, this quartz, these quartz grain boundaries might start to migrate, and uh, they can get pinned on these surfaces of mica. The result would be that if these grain boundaries migrate, they migrate until they are reaching the end of these mica crystals. And if they do that in two directions, this direction and that direction, the result would be an elongate shape of a quartz crystal in between these uh, these micas. You see that here and here, these uh, some 10 minerals, these uh, about 10 crystals have been replaced by only two, and the two um, resulting quartz crystals have an elongate shape that is intensifying the perception of foliation when you look at that in thin section or macroscopically. So these are the essential processes how foliations can form and how they can get more pronounced in the field, how they can get more pronounced in rocks.
How do we classify such foliations? Uh, they have different appearances in the field, and there are uh, some important ones. Cleavage and schistosity are those, and they have subtypes, as we have seen before. The, class the criteria to classify them is the spacing between the cleavage domains. That means those, do those domains in which uh, well-aligned crystals are enriched. Typically, these would be sheet sil silicates. The grain size is important, and further, the presence or absence of microlithons and granulations helps to subdivide these types, cleavage and schistosity, further. Again, from Pashi and Chao, here we see this uh, diagram that illustrates what we are talking about. And uh, uh, this is a simple flow diagram where you ask uh, two important questions. Are microlithons present, yes or no? And uh, if there are microlithons present, are there further granulations present within these microlithons? So a fairly straightforward um, classification scheme. So let's see. If there are no microlithons present, and in a minute we will explain what microlithons are, then we are talking about a continuous foliation, which we can subdivide in continuous cleavage, sometimes also called slaty cleavage, if the rock is fine-grained, which means with the naked eye you cannot or you struggle to identify individual crystals. If the rock is fairly coarse-grained and you can identify individual grains with the unaided eye, so without hand lens or microscope, you would talk about a continuous schistosity. And the characteristic of such foliations is uh, that they are through-going, that they are continuous and uniform through a certain proportion of the rock. This might change at a larger scale, but if you have a hand specimen or a significant part of an outcrop or a specific lithology in an exposure in the field that fulfills this criteria, a uniformly spaced and foliation aligned in a parallel orientation, uh, then you would call this a continuous foliation, either cleavage fine-grained in a shale or a mica schist, for instance, or in a phyllite, or you would talk about a schistosity if you're talking about a gneiss, from it, for instance. So then, if there are microlithons present, the rock looks different. Microlithons are these parts that separate areas where the cleavage is very well developed and strongly pronounced. The presence of Microlithons also requires the presence of so-called cleavage domains, so the rock is non-homogeneous. You have areas where micas most normally are enriched and pronounce a, a strong foliations. These would be the cleavage domains. Often they are mutually parallel. Uh, sometimes they are uh, anastomosing, as it is indicated here in this part of our diagram. But these cleavage domains are strongly separated by areas that are more or less mica-free and uh, usually, therefore, do not show a uh, prominent foliation. These would be normally areas that are rich in quartz and feldspar and perhaps garnet or staurolite or other non platy minerals. So the segregation of uh, well-foliated domains from domains that are not well-foliated, that defines the presence of cleavage domains and microlithons in between. So if you have such a situation with microlithons and cleavage domains, then uh, we would subdivide this spaced foliation category into spaced cleavage, again, if it's fine-grained, or spaced chistosity, if it's coarse-grained. Well, very simple. Fine-grained rocks have cleavages, coarse-grained rock rocks have schistosities, either continuous or spaced one. So one step further, we could find situations where within the microlithons we recognize microfolding of an earlier foliation, of a foliation that is older than the cleavage domains that dominate and that are, in the, our example here, oriented vertically. But of course, you can turn that around as you like in the field. Uh, Typically, in textbooks, uh, important things are always highlighted, either vertical or horizontal. In the field, uh, the orientation can be random. 
So if you have such microlithons with a uh, microfolding in between, you are talking about a crenulation cleavage. The crenulation are the microfolds. The crenulation cleavage is what overprints these microfolds with a new foliation, which always is uh, located at the limbs of these microfolds. It doesn't go through the hinges here. Yeah. We are going to see uh, in a minute how these crenulation cleavages and crenulations form. Then there is this uh, term of disjunctive foliation or cleavage, uh, which actually is quite unnecessary because if your answer are crenulations recognized in the microlithons is no, what you have is a spaced foliation, either a cleavage or a schistology. So there is actually no difference between this case and that case, and this makes the term disjunctive foliation or cleavage uh, a little bit superfluous. This is also reflected in the confusion that you find in different textbooks. When you look here at Pashi and Trau, uh, there are certain definitions for dis disjunctive foliation and spaced foliation. But when you look at another textbook, Davis and Reynolds, for instance, then the definitions are just swapped. What is spaced in the uh, Pashi and Trau definition is disjunctive in the uh, Davis and Reynolds one and vice versa. And I would just discourage the use of the term disjunctive. It is pretty much the same, like spaced foliations. Important, as always, in uh, geology is uh, that you describe what you see in the field and give it a reasonable name uh, so everybody knows what you are talking about. So here we see the classification scheme again, and here we see a few examples taken from Pashia and Charles' textbook. Here an example of continuous cleavage, and uh, this is a thin section photograph, uh, black and white. Of course, you can have all sorts of colors under the microscope. But what you see is a uniform alignment of sheet silicates. Now and then, there are some layers that are a little bit more coarser grained, where there might be a little bit more quartz. But there is no clear segregation of uh, micas and uh, quartz feldspar into uh, cleavage domains or microlithons. This is a fairly uniform part of a rock that has a homogeneous foliation, a continuous cleavage in that, in that example. On the right hand side we have a much better segregation. We see here uh, foliation planes that uh, exclusively or almost exclusively contain micas and they are sharply defined and uh, in between we see essentially Quartz, fine grain quartz, recrystallized quartz. Now and then there is a little bit of mica, but here is a clear separation between cleavage domains and areas that do not show such a prominent cleavage. These would be the microlithons. This is a spaced foliation, or if you want, a disjunctive foliation. And since we are dealing with fine grained rocks, we would classify this as a spaced cleavage. We cannot see any evidence of microfolding in the um, in the microlithons, and therefore this is definitely not a granulation cleavage. In order to explain how granulation cleavage is formed, we need to talk about the process of the transposition of foliations, which simply means that an overprint is obscuring earlier foliations and forms a new foliation. This is a very common process in the evolution of orogenic belts. It is almost always associated with folding, and it is most prominently developed in mica-rich rocks, which automatically means uh, we are dealing with green schist or fibrolite facies conditions, because in the granulite facies, the micas normally break down. This requires lateral shortening and uh, normally would lead to the formation of an actual plane cleavage in such mica-rich rocks. In consequence, and if this process is uh, at an advanced stage with the accumulation of high strain, the first foliation might become entirely destroyed. Let's see how that goes. Here we see a illustration of uh, a layered rock, which essentially with a planar 
uh, foliated rock with different layers, say mica ridge layers and uh, quartz ridge layers, in a space foliation, let's call it S1. And this uh, rock undergoes horizontal shortening. In the early stage, all we see are such open folds, which at micro scale might be micro folds of the layering uh, or S1, the first foliation. And uh, here we do not see much disintegration of the original layering or the original foliation. If we increase the uh, amount of shortening, say here to 30%, we will increase the amplitude of the folds. And we will see that the thinning of the limbs starts here in areas where dissolution is uh, most prominent. And dissolution is most prominent in areas where you have a mixture of quartz, which is easy to dissolve, and other minerals, such as mica, which are not easy to dissolve. And uh, this is also the area where fluids are usually more present than in uniform quartzite layers, for instance because quartzite has a low pore space uh, capacity. So this process of uh, increasing the amplitude and uh, shortening, reducing the interlimb angle, will start to dissolve uh, quartz in specific positions here on the limbs. And this process continues with increasing shortening. Here we have 50% shortening, and we see that also here on the limbs now the quartzite layers started to be thinned, and we see an increase in thickness here in the hinges. This is uh, the formation of uh, similar folds. We also see here that in these positions where dissolution creeps was most effective, micas have become enriched, and they are going to be rotated in a orientation, roughly parallel to the developing axial surface. And this process is here shown at an advanced stage, 60-70% shortening, and these are just examples. The magnitude might change from rock type to rock type, but typically at 60% uh, of shortening, we might be at a stage where we have the coalescence of micas here in uh, these positions where dissolution creep started and where micas are now rotated in a vertical orientation. This then defines a new foliation, the S2 foliation. In between these S2 foliations, which now form the new cleavage domain here, shown in black, we will see that the microlithons are still present, where dissolution creep was not so effective and where quartz was not removed to the same extent by dissolution creep, like along the S2 foliations. These would be the microlithons, and these microlithons show hinges of these microfolds. These are our granulations, the foliations that have formed during this process are called the granulation cleavage. So granulation cleavage and granulation is not the same. Granulation refers to the microfolding of the original layering or S1. Granulation cleavage refers to the newly formed S2 foliation that is parallel to the actual surface of these microfolds. This is what we mean when we talk about the transposition of foliations. It means that an older foliation undergoes shortening and dissolution creep forms a new foliation uh, parallel or roughly parallel to the actual surface of the folds, of the microfolds that are forming. So here this would be uh, essentially processes that form at small scale, at microscopic scale or up to hand specimens. Here's a thin section photograph. Here you find an example of microfolding, of granulation. You see here, this would become a uh, microlithon. And the mica abundance is here lower than along these surfaces here. These are the newly formed S2 foliation. So here, highlight the granulate microlithon. And here we see the newly forming S2. Now also here in this microlithon, and in this microlithon, microlithon, you see the granulated foliations defined by biotite in this, in this example. Another example from Pashi and Trau's textbook, granulations here in the microlithons, 
uh, new foliation in the um, cleavage domains, S2. This would be the granulation cleavage. Here we see the granulations here and here and here and actually everywhere. This is a series of uh, photographs taken in the field. You see here for scale a pencil. And uh, this shows increasing strain affecting such an area. Here we have uh, moderate str strain and here we have high strain. And you see how the granulations are getting obliterated. So evidence for the presence of a earlier foliation are here practically gone. And here they are uh, still pretty evident. And you might see such a succession of areas with increasing strain in the field, and you should look out for that. Very often you find preservation of earlier structures in low strain zones and the dominant fo formation of the youngest structure in the high strain zones, and you find something in between. So here are the granulations in the microlithons, or are still very, very obvious. You can clearly see them. Uh, being cross-cut here by the younger foliation. Here uh, the uh, granulations are becoming less abundant and uh, more strongly overprinted. And here in this example, you really have to look hard for evidence that there was actually once an earlier foliation. Down here, you see a little bit of a relic of a granulation in a microlithon surrounded by cleavage domains. And the proportion of cleavage domains increases from here the low strain zone to the high strain zone. We can have a very similar process at larger scale. That is what we would call the transposition of folds. And uh, that would be the equivalent to granulation cleavages. But uh, we are now looking at the macro scale. Also here, we require intense lateral shortening during folding. We would convert a folded rock to a layered rock. And uh, most Commonly, this would uh, happen in high-grade metamorphic rocks, medium to high-grade metamorphic rocks. What will happen in that process is that the limbs of layers of the more competent layers are getting disrupted uh, by the process of boudinage, which we are going to investigate in the uh, next section in more detail. Here we see how that happens. Look at the layered rock with different rock types. Uh, one of them has a higher competence than the other. And in this case, the black layer here is more competent than the white layer with a dashed pattern that we see here into layers. And with increasing shortening, and in this case, it's a bit of an asymmetric shortening, we get these kinds of parasitic folds, uh, which increase in amplitude with increasing strain. We see here the thickening of the hinges and the thinning of the limbs which uh, finally leads to the disruption of the thinned out limbs. And that's what we see here. This is a typical hook geometry of such lenses. And these hooks indicate that the, these here were once hinges where the connecting layer, the connecting limb to the next hinge, for instance, this one, got disrupted uh, in the process of boudinage, which is, in fact, a brittle form of failure. We are going to come back to this. In the next step, you would remove these hooks here by usually dissolution creep. And that then leaves a pattern of lens-shaped competent rock in uh, less competent rock, forming a layered geometry, a layered pattern. If you just look at the high strain result here, it will be very difficult to uh, reco reconstruct this sort of history. But if you know how this process happens from here to here, you can look out in lower strain zones, for instance, for such hooks. Some of them might have survived. And this gives you evidence that we are not looking here at lenses in a layered rock. We are looking at disrupted fold limbs. This would be good evidence for the fact that we are not having lenses, primary lenses, that these lenses are the result of the transposition of folds um, by boudinage following more and more intense folding of such a primary layered sequence. So check for relic hinges that will help you to identify areas where the transposition of folds has happened. Here we see such an example, uh, how that might look in the field. You see here now in this example the 
white layer was the more competent one. This got disrupted in irregularly shaped Buddhas. Uh, and if you look very carefully here, this might be the relic of a hinge. And uh, also in other places, you might be lucky to find evidence for the transposition of folds, explaining the presence of these lenses in such a layered uh, or lens rich, lens rich sequence. Let's talk about myelonitic foliation in ductile shear zones. We uh, see here uh, processes that lead to a significant grain size reduction and that almost always requires plastic deformation. There can be grinding in the brittle field, uh, which uh, also might uh, dramatically reduce the grain size and uh, also might produce uh, sort of foliation. That also would be myelonides, because the definition of a myelonide is simply a tectonic grain size reduction and the formation of a tectonic foliation during that process. That is a myelonide. But as I said, most commonly this happens in the plastic field of deformation. It can happen in the brittle ductile transition or even in the brittle field, uh, but that is less common. We will, however, have the opportunity to see such examples here in the Cape Fold Belt. What we normally see in Myelonitic foliation in myelonitic shear zones is a significant increase of strain towards the myelonide, towards the center of such a myelonide zone. The strain amount is not uniform, and a myelonide is, per definition, a high strain zone surrounded by lower strain domains. We will find intense recrystallization of porphyroclasts, and uh, this will then range from proto to ultramyelonide. So proto-myelonides would uh, show a very limited amount of recrystallization and grain size reduction. An ultramyelonide, uh, we would, uh, in an ultramyelonide, we would see this process has come to a very advanced state. Also that we will see in the next few slides. What very often happens is that myelonides cross-cut earlier foliations, and these earlier foliations might then be dragged into the shear zone with increasing strain amount towards the myelonite, and this can help us to determine the shear sense, although that is a non-trivial task. And uh, we will come back to that at honors level when we are looking at myelonite zones in the field. Recrystallization, this term that I have been using uh, repeatedly here in this uh, lecture, is a process where a grain, a larger grain, is replaced by smaller grains during deformation, and these smaller grains are of the same mineral species and uh, approximately the same composition. So you have a large quartz grain, and you deform that quartz grain in the ductile field. It will respond by recrystallizing, which means out of a large deformed grain, you form small undeformed grains. Also, this process we need to investigate a little bit further. Here we see such an example of a myelonite zone with various degrees, various intensities of deformation. Here in the, on the right-hand side, you see a probably granitic rock where you have evidence for brittle deformation. You see here brittle offset in this class. You see also some sort of uh, foliation, vague foliation forming. But clearly here, uh, the foliation is not very strongly pronounced. When you compare that to this area here, specifically where you see a very, very intense uh, foliation and a strong stretching out of individual grains, this would be the myelonite. This would be uh, probably the whole rock, which has seen some deformation, but much less than this ultramyelonite. But there is not only the ultramyelonite. Let's have a look here at this portion of the rock. Here you see a fairly clearly visible foliation. Uh, spaced foliation with uh, concentrations of micas on some of these surfaces and uh, microlithons in between, where we have uh, essentially feldspar and perhaps some quartz present. Uh, this would be a spaced foliation in a protomyelonite. Down here we have what we would call a myelonitic foliation. Here we see a fairly intense alignment 
of um, ICAS and we see a clear separation between uh, cleavage domains and the microlithons, which are quartz, perhaps feldspar rich, and we see a significant grain size reduction compared to the protomyelonite and more so to the uh, protolith that we see over here. So here we would go from the protolith to the protomyelonite to the myelonite and eventually to the ultramyelonite. In the ultramyelonite, you see virtually no clasts anymore. A few small clasts are here, although it is clear that this portion of the rock once had the same texture and the same grain size like the protolith that we see here. So in an ultramyelonite, you see an intense ductile stretching of individual grains. So grains that were once of this size have reduced in size or have been flattened and stretched out into long lenses. Essentially, quartz would be susceptible to this uh, intense stretching. Feldspar, more typically in such, in such rocks, would break up into small fragments in a semi-ductile, semi-brittle manner that we also already see here uh, in evidence with the offset of that feldspar part from that feldspar part. So in ultramyelonites, you struggle to find individual clasts but from the field relationships and the gradual increase of strain from the protolith via the protomyelonite, the myelonite, to the ultramyelonite, you can re reconstruct what happened to the protolith in order to form an ultramyelonite. Intense grain size reduction, intense alignment of markers, of crystals, of stretched out crystals, uh, and perhaps enrichment of micas which is not necessarily the case. Also the micas might break down, uh, might get dissolved in such ultramyelonitic zone. This is a matter for thin section petrography. And again, we are going to look at such zones uh, in the uh, uh, honors field course in the next year. Some uh, schematic sketches that illustrate the conversion of a myelonite to an ultramyelonite. In a myelonite, you have a strong foliation. You already have high strain. You find here uh, clasts, rounded clasts, sigma and delta clasts. We come back to that. Uh, or phi clasts. We come back to that in the section on shear sense indicators. Uh, when you convert this by accumulating more and more strain to an ultramyelonite, you can see how these clasts are disappearing uh, by the process of grain size reduction, which can be an association of mechanical breakdown, of fracturing, or of dissolution creep, depending on the temperature and the presence of a fluid phase. Uh, it also can be simply recrystallization, replacement of large clasts by smaller clasts in the course of plastic deformation. Let's talk about linear fabric elements. Linear fabric elements uh, also can be primary. Uh, primary lineations, again, like all primary structures, formed before the lithification of the rock. Uh, that can be ripples in a sandstone, which might form a linear arrangement. It can be a pahoihoi lava, ropey lava, that uh, ar arranges itself in a linear, uniformly oriented uh, fashion. And it can be the alignment of crystals during magma flow in the crystal melt mush. But again, we are not interested in such uh, primary fabric elements. We need to be aware that they might exist. But uh, in a structure course, we essentially would look at secondary lineations. And these are the lineations that form by deformation processes. So the first one can be an intersection lineation simply by intersecting two planar structures that are not parallel to each other. That can be a joint and a bedding plane, or a joint and a cleavage, or two cleavage planes, or whatever. Two different types of planar structures intersect. And when they intersect, they will create a trace on each other. That is a fabric element, a linear fabric element that you can see on planar structures, on rocks. Then granulations, lineations. We have uh, seen the process of uh, microfolding, and these microfolds have hinges. These hinge lines form a linear fabric element. The crests and the trough in granulated cleavages will display a lineation, and that will be parallel to the fold axis of these microfolds. 
Uh, the third group are mineral lineations, and that would be the alignment of fiber-like or prismatic minerals by oriented growth. So they will nucleate and grow in a specific orientation, and this is usually stress field controlled or controlled by a pre-existing foliation and directed fluid flow. So we can argue whether this is a primary or a secondary feature, but usually you require a stress field and uh, some sort of at least potential for deformation in order to um, control the oriented growth of sub such fibers or um, prismatic minerals. Here we do not necessarily have ongoing strain. So this is not the passive rotation of pre-existing amphiboles or siliconites or any other fiber-like mineral into a preferred orientation. This would be the stretching. Stretching lineations are the kinematically most important type of lineations because they, they reveal the direction of tectonic transport. And this stretching and rotation happens assisted by crystal plastic deformation. You have to have a ductile rock in order to rotate crystals, fibrous crystals, in a preferred orientation. So this is the difference to mineral lineations. If you want to conclude that you are looking at a stretching lineation, you should be able to associate the growth and the orientation of such uh, crystals with the presence of uh, intense deformation in the matrix of these crystals. Then there are fiber lines. Fiber lines are transitional between mineral and stretching lineations because you might remember how fiber lines form. They form uh, during hydraulic fracturing, during uh, fracturing of the rock and displacement of rocks along fault planes in the presence of a fluid phase. And from this fluid phase, we precipitate minerals in a linear orientation, in a linear or with a linear geometry, for instance, quartz fibers or uh, calcite fibers might form and indicate the orientation of tectonic transport. However, this is a process of displacement, but the minerals themselves are not deformed. They are not stretched, at least not to a intense um, magnitude. They form and they grow in that fibrous and oriented, uh, in contrast to stretching lineations which overprints pre-existing crystals in orientation and shape. Anyway, both fiber lines and uh, classical or uh, stretching lineations in the narrow sense should be used to determine the direction of tectonic transport. And therefore, you need to distinguish them from the other types of lineations, specifically intersection lineations, or also crenulations or mineral lineations, which do not indicate the orientation of tectonic transport. So let's have a look here at these uh, sketches. Here we see uh, intersection lineations, two non-parallel planar fabric elements intersect with each other. And here on uh, each of them, or also on joints, you will see traces of these intersection lineations, of these foliations cropping out on a surface uh, that we see here. This has nothing to do with uh, indicating kinematic orientation. This is not the transport generation. This is not the transport direction in that rock. This is just the trace of one of these foliations on another surface. We see that here. And if we would draw out, say, this inclined surface here, we would find the trace of the more horizontal surface on it as a intersection lineation. Here we see uh, crenulation lineations. As we said, these are the hinges of microfolds. Again, this is not the uh, direction of tectonic shortening or tectonic transport. These are just the hinges of microfolds defining a crenulation lineation. Then we see here two examples uh, of uh, most likely stretching lineations. Uh, we see here in a quartzite, the flattening of quartz grains and the stretching of quartz grains in a preferred orientation. So what we need to do is to find the foliation in this rock, which would be the top of this block, 
and uh, then look in which direction are uh, the crystals most intensely lengthened. In uh, an orientation like this, that means perpendicular to the lineation, we would see more isometric cross-section. Parallel to the lineation and perpendicular to the foliation, again, we would see a lengthening, the stretching of the individual uh, quartz grains. Though it is important when you look at lineations that you get a 3D exposure, that you look at all directions onto such a, uh, a rock that might have a lineation. This could be, for instance, some sort of pencil nice, and we have talked about that in the second year. Here we see also rod-like shapes uh, of uh, small, fine-grained, recrystallized lenses. These lenses also display a kind of a pencil structure. You see here the round cross-sections on uh, this side here, and you see the long, stretched-out lenses where, for instance, Felsbar has undergone a finer-grained recrystallization, and in the matrix, the quartz shows a coarse-grained foam texture. So these kinds of patterns uh, would indicate stretching and stretching lineations. Here finally we see mineral lineations. These would just be uh, platy minerals or uh, prismatic or uh, fibrous minerals that are well aligned. Here we cannot associate a uh, significant amount of strain with the uh, alignment of these crystals because here we see a foam pattern in the uh, matrix, a foam pattern might have followed intense deformation, but uh, we cannot easily say that these minerals have uh, grown before the uh, deformation took place that eventually was recovered and recrystallized in this rock. So here I would be very careful to associate the alignment of these crystals with a certain deformation event. It might be possible, it might be even likely, likely that this has happened. Uh, but we don't have good evidence at this stage. Uh, the same is the case here. Here we see no evidence of uh, strain in the rock uh, other than the alignment of crystals. And this might be a mineral uh, lineation, a preferred oriented growth in a static environment. So mineral lineations are uh, to be dealt with uh, carefully. Uh, it is uh, much better to look at good evidence for deformation like the recrystallization and the long stretched shape of the recrystallized lenses as we see here, or the um, strong shape preferred orientation and alignment of, say, quartz crystals in such an environment. Again, this is uh, something that we are going to practice in the uh, honors course when we go to the field. I want to remind you to the tectonites that we, that we have discussed in the last year. Here in the S-tectonites, you will not find linear fabric elements because you are dealing with uh, a pure flattening strain, an oblate strain. Uh, in areas where you are dealing with prolate strain, you will have a very strong lineation, but you will not find uh, the uh, foliation at all or very intensely. If you go into somewhere in the middle of the Flynn diagram, you will deal with, with LS tectonites, where both fabric elements, lineations, and foliations are uh, developed, perhaps equally strongly developed, then you probably are somewhere along the plane strain line. Or you will have the dominance strongly lineated and somewhat foliated rocks in the constrictional field, or uh, strongly foliated rocks with some lineation, then you would be in the oblate field of strain. This is the end of our first chapter and of our first slideshow. It's uh, about an hour's uh, long lecture. Uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, reviewing what I have tried to convey to you. Thank you very much.